Okay. Thank you. First of all, uh, I introduce myself. I work in shoulder pathologies, only in shoulder pathologies and uh, elbow pathologies since uh, 2005, so a long time ago. And from 2006, uh, I collaborate for the development of um, assessment tools that can help us to um, evaluate the motion of the scapula and of the upper limb. So it's not only in the pandemic period, but a <laughs> long time before. And so today I, I will speak about these new, uh, new technologies and uh, how they can help us to um, the evaluation and also the treatment of the shoulder pathologies. First of all, let's start. So what we hear today, we talk about um, adhesive capsulitis and how the stiffness can change the movement of the scapula. We talk about rotator cuff tear and the same problem, the same problem and the, the lack of strength of the supraspinatus uh, don't uh, put down the humeral ads, so there is a compensation of the scapula to the, the, the typical shrug sign when uh, the patient performed the upper elevation. Then we talk about instability. Uh, today we, we have looked um, uh, a case of anterior dislocation. Uh, I, I will talk to you about posterior dislocation that are always instability but really different in the treatment. Then we, we speak about reverse uh, total shoulder atroplastic right now. And uh, for me, it's really interesting this, uh, this pathology because we see a lot, uh, like an explosion of treatment or reverse total shoulder atroplastic, but already probably um, uh, the therapist doesn't know very well the biomechanics concept of this kind of uh, um, device. So what does all these diseases in common? They perform a scapular dyskinesis. But why the reason? Because I'm interested in these new technologies, because uh, I want to make a parallelism. Uh, I hope you will understand. If uh, for uh, uh, an expert surgeon, when you see a diagnosis of scapular humeral paratrisis, you understand that that surgery is not so great because it's not a diagnosis. It's just the same way, another way to, to say that there is some inflammation around the shoulder so we don't understand anything with this diagnosis. In the same way, we cannot speak of a diagnosis of scapular humeral dyskinesis. Scapular humeral dyskinesis is not a diagnosis. So please stop to write that. Scapular humor dyskinesis is just an alteration of physiological movement, as Ben Kibler told us a few years ago, and uh, can be musculoskeletal causes. If you read, the, probably all the pathology around the shoulder can perform a scapular dyskinesis and that we can call secondary dyskinesis or primary dyskinesis like neurological co uh, causes like the... Um, the problem of long thoracic nerve dorsal of the scapular uh, accessory nerve. And for me, passing through uh, the um, 2D from 3D point of view is like for a surgeon, the 3D scan compared to that X-ray. Today we, we talk about the, uh, the evaluation of the follow-up after a period of rehabilitation. Right now we use uh, today the constant scale to evaluate the range of motion. But what does Constance K told us about the movement of the scapula and the movement of the humerus? So the use of this new device uh, can give us a lot of information of the movement and all the compensation while the patient is performing the movement. Here you can see just um, a simple video to understand how it's functioning. There are seven uh, uh, inertial magnetic sensors applied to the body, to the main axis of the, uh, the patient, two in the forearm, two uh, in the humerus, two in the spine of the scapula, one in the thorax. Inside, in a, inside every sensor, there are three sensors, a gyroscope, an accelerometer, and a magnetometer that can give us in real time the position of this sensor um, through the earth magnetic pole. So, um, we can um, see very well in real time the movement of the main axis, not only of the arm, but also from, for the scapulothoracic. 
Now it's really important for me that you will understand this kinematic correlation graph because we will talk about this kind of uh, images with kind of data. So it's important to understand what you are seeing. Um, while the patient is performing an abduction, you see in the video, the, this is an, an old video, uh, no wireless uh, sensor, but it's the same way. Right now is wireless, is easier to apply. But while the patient is performing uh, this um, uh, abduction, the lines go to the right. Okay, you can, you can read the shoulder abduction. Okay, then um, while the, the patient is performing an upward rotation of the scapula, the scapula is uh, getting, the, the line is getting higher, in a higher position. So that the kinematic data of scapular humeral rhythm, okay, that the images of what we are seeing, but we cannot write right now, okay. Uh, up to date, we use also uh, other device in the same analysis uh, that are um, surface electromyography to measure the timing and intensity of the superficial muscle. And so it's possible in less than an hour to evaluate the movement of the bilateral side of the, uh, the arm. Now some practical use in uh, our daily practice. We can use this for the evaluation during the process of rehabilitation. As we know, it's a long period. Uh, the question was how long we have to, uh, to make the, the, um, the, the rehabilitation. The using of this device can help us also to monitoring while the patient is performing the, the process. As you can see in the line, this is a patient who performed a rotator cuff surgery after 30 days. Um, the tendon is not enough strength, obviously. He performed the elevation only with the movement of the scapula. As you can see in the line, there is poor humerus elevation and the upper rotation is really um, most uh, evident. And it starts at first, uh, at the, um, at st when start the movement, start always the scapula, not the humeral elevation. We check this patient after 70 days and then after 90 days, you see uh, in the uh, light black, uh, in the healthy side, okay, and the black one is the pathological, you can say how during the period of rehabilitation, the compensation of the scapula is getting lower, okay? So we understand with, a, with something that is right, it's not a... Uh, like what we we see, but uh, is uh, real. We can check how is the compensation of the scapula. In a follow up uh, of uh, eight months, so after he come back to work, there is the complete recover of um, range of motion, active range of motion, and the disappearance of compensation. The, you see the line are like overlapping, so the same kinematic of the scapular humor rate. Another argument that for me is really important and uh, I'm, I'm happy that we talk about this uh, today, um, the difference between the anatomical and the reverse prosthesis for, from the point of view of the kinematic. Here you can see a young patient performing an arm elevation. You see is a better um, result for elevation and also is a better result for what does that mean the symmetry of the medial border of the scapula. At the end of the movement, the anatomical one is uh, really symmetric to the trunk. The reverse side is not so symmetric. But we have to correct this difference? I think no. Because the reason that the surgeon choose to perform the reverse total shoulder optoplastic is because the absence of the rotator cuff, uh, the activation of the deltoid, perform an upper elevation of the humeral lead, and the choosing of the reverse total shoulder arthroplastic is necessary to give the best power arm for the deltoid with the lateralization, so we need a greater contribution of the scapula. Here you can see a woman that is, is about uh, 75 years old, uh, uh, he performed a reverse total shoulder arthroplastic. This is a follow-up after 12 months after surgery. 
you look why she's performing we see there is a difference of the movement of the scapula but right now we are able to detect this difference and to understand why some um, the question was uh, uh, all the patients uh, uh, are able to reach that result here we can find how some patient get this result how the scapula um, um, how, how much compensated the scapula and when the scapula starts to compensate here you look there is the, the upper rotation while the patient is performing the elevation uh, in the light blue um, light blue line is the pathologic one okay the pink uh, is the healthy side the upper, ro upper rotation of the scapula starts really early but the most important compensation is about tilting and retraction look at the curve if you look uh, uh, there are two lines in the tilting okay the graph in the middle there are two lines the upper line is the while the patient is getting the higher position so it's the first part of the movement the second line down is one when he rests he come back okay so uh, both in the tilting and the retraction the movement of the scapula is performing at the start of the elevation okay so we don't have to change this for me obviously what we can discuss we don't have to change this kind of compensation because all this patient all the patients that we analyze that go really well perform this kind of motion another thing is interesting is the, the evaluation of the electromyographic surface we know but we check how is the, the, the activation of the anterior deltoid look uh, the reference scale is different and uh, in the pathological one the anterior deltoids activated uh, uh, two times and a half than the other one and also the superior trapezius activate uh, most two times than the healthy side so change a word here we talk about functional posterior shoulder instability there is really most uh, common uh, we see a lot of this kind of patient young with a lot of uh, uh, laxity this girl is performing an elevation when you see the snapping movement is not the dislocation okay when he performs the snapping movement he put the humeral head inside again the dislocation perform at the half of the movement look with attention at about 80 degree we can see the humeral head posteriorly okay right now and then relocate okay so this girl is not able to control the movement that oh sorry that was happening inside okay but obviously we cannot perform a fluoroscopy for every patient that comes in our clinic is not good so we use this new device to analyze the biomechanical aspect because we know uh, all these patients are the problem for the surgeon because the problem is the laxity but the motor pattern muscular activation okay so this is a patient that was able to perform the, move, the pathological movement look the hand is facing down so it's performing an internal internal rotation look at the graph if you remember in the uh, in the other graph that i showed you the upper rotation is getting higher while the patient is performing an elevation here are in the in the opposite way is go down because while he's performing the elevation the humeral head dislocated the posteriorly and the scapula pulled down in front okay this kind of patient is controllable is able to control the humeral lead and to to put the humeral lead inside again look at the hand right now is facing up okay so is in an external rotation and if you look the scapula don't come out uh, like the other one like the other video if you compare the two analyses we can see that the upper rotation is uh, restored okay there is more tilting and there is also more uh, retraction 
here is really interesting the activation of the muscle. The surface electromyography shows us that the superior trapezius is a lack of activation in the pathological movement. In the same way, also the uh, anterior, data, uh, anterior deltoid doesn't perform a good activation. The only muscle that we find that is hyperactivated is the latissimus dorsi, that is an internal rotator and the pressure of humeral head. Here you can see an example of the, our daily practice of this kind of patient. Now um, he's performing Y movement, uh, um, a four movement uh, correctly, then he performed three movement uh, with the dislocation of humeral head. Look at the graph and look how the scapula go uh, in an anterior tilting. Okay, so you can see in real time the, the, the tracking of the system is really, really um, uh, prestigious. And the same, in the same way, an hyperactivation of latissimus dorsi why, why he is performing the pathological movement. So, uh, in the last three years, we make another foot <laughs> for uh, our practice because we need to pass from the analysis to the exercise with, um, is not satisfying to understand what is the problem of biomechanics. We want to change the biome biomechanics. So why these two devices are linked? Because inside the shoulder pacemaker, that is an um, um, electrical muscle stimulator, but inside the shoulder pacemaker, there is the same inertial magnetic sensor that is inside the show motion system. So, for the first time, electrical stimulation is linked to the motion of the, pa of the patient. The activation of the muscle starts while the patient is moving his arm. And we, we put the electrodes into the muscle that we want to get more strength and more active while, she, while he's performing the movement. And, uh, we indirect, indirectly inhibit the activation of hyperactive muscle. As you see a video that is really clear for me. While the patient is elevating, you see the red light that is getting uh, uh, on uh, more and more. The electrodes are put into the um, infraspinatus and uh, medial trapezius. And so, for the first time, the electrical stimulation is not before or after our therapy but we can perform our therapy while the patient is using the device. We talk about the motor pattern activation is not a problem of strengths, okay? All that people um, don't have a problem of strength or lack of strengths. Probably they have a problem of the timing of the activation. Some, something of this patient doesn't understand what is the muscle that they have to contract, okay? So, uh, I speak, um, I, I write to you um, a muscular proprioceptics apparatus. This device uh, makes the patient able to feel what the muscle that he has to, to activate and in, um, uh, in what timing of the movement. Here I show you some example of uh, exercise because Inside the um, device, uh, um, in a tablet, uh, there, is, there are a lot of protocol that uh, is uh, easier to, to use. Look, uh, the girl is performing by herself the exercise looking of the tablet that is able to count also the repetition. The difficulty is getting higher while she's performing the protocol. But we want to check the changing of the biomechanical after the session of uh, um, the use of shoulder pacemaker. If you can see in the blue line, there is the upper rotation while it's performing an arm elevation look that is the downward uh, of the scapula. So while she's performing the um, posterior subluxation of the humeral head, the scapula is uh, getting in the wrong position. After the period of rehabilitation, change the the kinematic movement of the scapula. 
inside. I told to you not only a protocol for shoulder instability because a, a new world is open right now because it's the first time that uh, electrical stimulation uh, is linked to the, to the moment. So we have to look forward to understand what are the best um, muscle training and uh, what are the best timing of training of our exercise. You can customize the protocol. <laughs> and uh, the last things I want to say to you, Right now, it's also possible to work uh, for the patient at home, but the most interesting thing is that we can remote monitoring this patient. So probably every one of us, say a patient to perform some exercise, he come back, oh, I perform every exercise every day, I feel a lot of pain. No, it's wrong, you're a liar because I see that you don't perform anything, okay? So it's really interesting for us. Thank you. I leave you my contacts for uh, any answer. So thank you. The upgrades is very nice and very interesting. And uh, what we realize now is that uh, not now it was realized a time ago that centering the humor ahead is not a. Uh, um, a problem of ligamentous uh, strength or elasticity. It is a problem of skill. The, the muscles are centering the humor head during motion and they take the message of where the humor head is from the tension of the ligaments. And there is a type of dislocation that it is muscle patterning dislocation. It's not very often, happily in Greece, at least, at least in my practice, but it is existing. But it's happening what uh, Gabriel was saying, that um, every time you raise the arm, the arm is dislocated, posteriorly, usually posteriorly or inferior. And the problem is how you can solve this. And uh, usually we are performing operations in the ligaments, hoping to solve this problem. Practic practically, the idea was and still is that if we retention, in, retention the ligaments, then it will be much easier for the muscles to regain the right muscle pattern. But now we have a, <coughs> an instrument that can bypass this by uh, relearning and re, uh, reactivate the muscles in the right pattern. Practically making conscious the unconscious uh, muscle uh, contraction. And by making it conscious, <coughs> much easier to control it. And by controlling it in slow motion, slowly you can start be able to control it in more rapid uh, motion. I think this is the way all these systems work and this system also. And I, I have the impression that it's going to be of great help, not only to the um, posterior dislocator, no. habitual posterior dislocator, that are unconscious of dislocation, uh, that they can't control the dislocation. If you can't control the dislocation, it's just a way of playing with your, your friends. But if this becomes uncontrollable, then it's a problem. And especially it's a problem if it's uncontrollable and painful. And this is the difficult problem. So, what do you think? Or, yes? Uh, my, my, my main concern about uh, that um, device and any device that is using currently superficial pads is that first you have to be very strict where you place the pads, it's number one. But secondly and most important is that the noise that you get 
from the surrounding muscles. So, if if I try to play, you take about uh, you talk about electromyography. Yes. Okay. So, in my in my mind, I think it it is something like an electromyography. So, yeah. if I, if you place the the electrode in the infraspinatus, so you have the infraspinatus. No, I don't detect the infraspinatus. Okay. No. 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 Um, I detect only superficial muscle that is bigger, superficial, and uh, that I'm sure that I cannot have a lot of crosstalk. Okay. Okay. So it's really important. This is a good question. Yeah. But if you if you want, for example, to to uh, to detect the activity of uh, latissimus dorsi, mm -hmm. we have the latissimus dorsi going up. On the top of latissimus dorsi, you have the teres uh, minor, major, and then on the top you have teres minor. So how can you distinguish? There is a little dorsi? part that is not um, uh, the first time is not so easy to put to the latissimus dorsi because it changed the position, but there is a, a little part not uh, is to to the back a little bit to the back that is is uh, is easy is easier okay but remember that this kind for this kind of analysis of this kind of patient the activation of this muscle start at the first part of the movement so the position of the, mu the muscle doesn't change so much while it's activating okay because there is there is not a angle movement is a translation of humeral head so it's not ch changing so much the position of the fiber of the muscle okay okay uh, just just a question about that when you apply the, the pad on the skin and you have the movement yeah you have the skin you have the, the fat you have the fascia and you have the muscle so if i place the electrode as i'm standing right now yeah. and i just slightly move it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that my skin will move accordingly to the muscle the muscle so there is there is a gap there yeah but if you place into some part of the skin you look how the patient is moving that all the electrodes stay always in the latissimus dorsi doesn't change so much if you even, even though that latissimus dorsi or any other muscle is sliding beneath the no the because skin. because you want to um, detect the activation of, of the electricity of that muscle so um, it, the problem is while you want to uh, detect a muscle with other muscles they are nearest so if you, the surgeon asks me uh, detect the subscapulary muscle no i don't i can't i can't okay but for latissimus dorsi uh, is not so so difficult this cross talk is not so big obviously if you put the electrodes on the pectoral at the rest position you detect also the hearth okay but the activation of the hearth is really lower than when you start to to push strands to the pectoral muscle okay so uh, the curve of a, of um, uh, apprehension okay to, to, to the curve to understand what the position is, is not so easy but when you, uh, you you are able i think the cross talk is not a so big problem and uh, let me just another say um, the difference of this kind of electromyography is not um, we cannot compare to the standard electromyography there are two different things one is for the nerve okay and it's impossible to perform movement while we are uh, doing the, <laughs> the you, you mean with the needles with yeah with the needle yeah. yeah that is an active um, electromyography okay so we have to use in different ways obviously uh, remember the cross talk and the surface uh, okay thank you very much you're welcome i would like to ask you something uh, how how difficult is to translate all those diagrams uh, in a, to a clinical to correlate to a clinical situation okay okay because uh, i 
I have used the both slow motion pacemaker and, yeah. and I'm impressed about uh, how they help. But when I, I as I, all all the times that I, I watch some presentation, I'm uh, confused mm. because also today. <laughs> They too, because <laughs> what are these di diagrams means? How we translate these diagrams? Uh, how we can correlate the malfunction of a muscle of a, of a, of a movement uh, to these diagrams? Because there are too many planes, there are too many muscles, there are too many movement, and so how you can uh, uh, keep the useful information? Obviously, the question of the clinician is really important. The clinician has to ask me. I want to look what does is performing the deltoids in this movement because if the clinician give me uh, the um, if write me perform a, 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 an evaluation of kinematic of electromyographic uh, data is like uh, the clinicians uh, tell me to record uh, the movement of the patient I see everything okay the question is what you want to to see okay so it depends on the pathology, okay? Um, for the reverse total shoulder to plastic, for example, uh, we want we use this device to understand if the scapula is performing all the entire motion or there is a lack of strength and so the tilting is not enough, okay? So it cannot reach the maximum uh, elevation because there is no more tilting, okay? So it depends on the question of the clinician. So I think it's better also for the clinician to understand how functioning this device. This is important. And, and this evaluation can be used as a diagnostic tool or as a follow-up tool. I mean, you can you can uh, answer the question, or you can uh, you are able to follow other patients in different. Uh, okay. Uh, right now, I can say, not so mm, conscious, but I can say that we know already the pathological curve. I, I, I was speaking about show motion. Okay. We are. Um, it's a long time we look at this curve or this graph and we are able also to understand why the patient are performing for example the dislocation of humeral lead without the fluoroscopy okay so it's like a sort of diagnosis but i think is not um, we cannot make a diagnosis only with that graph we can focus our our eyes in some areas okay but we cannot perform diagnosis, okay? It's not uh, artificial intelligence, okay? But for the follow-up, obviously, is the best way to detect uh, the compensation of the movement because the constant scale is, is not enough. Okay. I have many questions. I will... <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Uh, <laughs> why posterior dislocation? And not anterior dislocation. Why it is difficult for the machine to uh, to use it in this uh, different angle situation? Because, uh, the shoulder pacemaker. The pacemaker. Because, okay. Because posterior dislocation are much lower in number than anterior dislocation. So uh, even for yeah, uh, mm, I think uh, um, when we start to look at this kind of pathology, we th we think that we're lower. Right now, we think that probably what there are a lot of dislocation, little dislocation that we did not detect. Okay, so I think also that a lot of O'Brien sign positive is not a slap lesion, but it has dislocation of humeral lead. So I think they are bigger than we think. But for anterior dislocation, um, the, the shoulder pacemaker is burned for that involuntary posterior dislocation because it's an alteration of pattern activation, okay? In the arterial dislocation, probably um, the most common problem is the 
stability of the soft tissues and uh, why the patient is performing also a passive movement, it dislocates. So probably you need uh, uh, help not for the timing of activation, but for the strength. Obviously, we can work it on uh, also for anterior dislocation, but I think the alteration of muscular pattern is uh, really most important in posterior dislocation. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. It was very, very clear for me. I would like to know if you have um, organized or you have scheduled any trials clinical trials or RCT, something like that, to publish how it works and where do you think that uh, it's more beneficial okay, or for, where for it's sure, not? Uh, it, it's easy. If mm. someone of us want to, to see the application, we can also perform mm -hmm. today, but after the end, I think mm -hmm. um, one, what you want from me is not a okay, problem. No. I'm here until tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock. Okay. No, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> So, thank you. Uh, for, You're welcome. For me, the most impressive in the pacemaker was that indicates to the patients what to do. And uh, it, it, uh, we have a tool uh, helping the patient to do the, the right movement. And, yeah. Uh, for me, it was uh, very interesting to understand that <laughs> the patients don't understand yeah. what should do and even and you have the verbal uh, uh, yeah because in, in the in the cortex all the back muscle has really poor in the neurological control not in the hand uh, with a big uh, part of the brain poor so the patient doesn't understand what he has to do and this is a feed forward mechanism yes. it's like uh, uh, something some patient uh, told me that it's like a, an e-bike okay when you drive an e-bike you feel that you are pushing to the to the bike but something is helping you and you perform really well it's like the same okay oh you use it already <laughs> so the question can be difficult Sometimes we, nowadays we try to, we, we monitor the movement. We use uh, our phone and uh, have a copy of uh, uh, the movement yeah. and we say to the patient, come and see, what yeah. are you doing? And most of them say, oh, oh. I do that. Yeah. That's why they don't know. Yeah, yeah. And the show motion is important also for that because uh, they understand that this is not a problem of tissues or bones or ligament. It's, it's a problem of, of movement. Of movement. Yeah. And th there are so many uh, muscles attached to, to, the, the uh, to the scapula and uh, short muscles with limited range of, range motion, of motion and they cannot uh, uh, feel yeah. uh, the movement. what they do. And uh, uh, it's impressive that with this they have better uh, ac um, accomplishments to the program. Yeah. They monitor that, they see that, uh, they feel that, and they see the progress and say, okay, I was at that point, now I'm that point, yeah. and, and I do that, and I came, uh, I reached this point. Yeah. So uh, they are more compliant to the program and because it's a neuromuscular coordination program uh, they need the time the repetition yeah. to learn to learn yeah yeah and, and it's also good because uh, is inside your hand uh, you have you choose the exercise in the protocol there are some exercises already performed but you can choose also to perform other kind of exercise using the pacemaker so if you are 
in a gym, you can work in a gym with a shoulder pacemaker. It's not, it's not a problem. Okay, thanks a lot. And this is the end of the, <laughs> this year, this yes. year of the course. Thank you, Thank you all. You. Thank you all for being here with us. I hope that it was interesting to you as it was for us. And uh, hope also to see the next days also to the um uh, to the course and uh, have these interactions and this um, uh, conversations and discussion trying to understand those two different point of views the operating the surgeons and the physiotherapists that have to be combined in order to have the best uh, result thank you and see you next year Watch.